Okay. We're getting it. It's... Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for our final program in our Lifelong Scholars Week 9 celebration of the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, um, which passed 100 years ago this month, really this week. Um, so we've been focused this whole week on programs to celebrate that and learn more about the suffrage movement itself. If you've happened to miss any of our programs from earlier this week, we do have those available on the Lakeside Facebook page and on the Lakeside calendar. So if you go to the Lakeside calendar and select the purple banner at the top of each of the dates, it'll take you to a page with a listing of all of the programs we had this week um, and the Zoom links to be able to watch those again. Uh, so with that reminder, I would like to welcome back Dr. Ana Rabinovich Fox. Um, she's joining us again this afternoon after this morning's program about the, um, looking at the use of fashion in the suffrage movement. And this afternoon, she's going to be telling us more about all of the commemoration activities um, that I'm hoping will continue through to the next year because of all the changes that have happened since they all began. Um, but with that, welcome back. Thank you, and uh, welcome back, everyone, and welcome those who cannot be here uh, this morning uh, and joining us now. Um, as Dakota said, uh, I will talk about the commemoration of the suffrage movement and uh, their activities, and to do that, I will share my screen with you um, so we can start. And. Um, when I was asked to give this talk today, uh, 2020 uh, looked like it's going to be a, a full event year, but kind of like a regular year, right? <laughs> We're gonna, uh, a year that will celebrate many anniversaries actually. Uh, and one of them is the 100 um, year for the passing of the 19th Amendment. Um, but of course, uh, COVID had a different plan uh, for this year, uh, so things have uh, changed a little, and uh, I thought I would spend most of this year, you know, going to museums and do all kind of commemorating activities, and, and COVID kind of like changed those plans a little, uh, but as um, Dakota said, I do think that some of the celebration will go on to 2021 um, and hopefully uh, some of the, the things that I will talk today, uh, you will have a chance um, to go and see. And, uh, and if not, I mean, there are a lot of things uh, going on right now online, like this lecture, um, many, many things are going on. So I do uh, invite you uh, to go to good resources uh, for this is the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission, uh, which is a great website. It has a lot of sources and also a lot of um, things of, of kind of like calendars of what's going on, a lot of things going on online. And if you want more of a Ohio perspective, there's um, also the Ohio Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission um that you can uh go there and and see what's going on um if you're ohio um native and kind of like more in the local um area um but as 2020 comes and you know it's uh, centennial years and anniversaries are always a good time uh to kind of like revisit uh, the past and kind of like think about the past in new ways. And I think, uh, especially with a, a suffered centennial, that's what's going on, um, both in recent years that was leading to the centennial and in this year, uh, really kind of like thinking, uh, what are we commemorating exactly? What is the story that we're telling? Um, and even more importantly, who are we forgetting in that story? or who have we omitted? Um, and memory and history as you know, our present tell us is a very live thing and it's a very political thing. Um, so the, as I said, like the act, the act of memori memorization as well as the act of forgetting um, is a very political thing and it's much in a debate. And I think uh, both the historians and public uh, are really uh, participating in that 
And, and the suffrage movement is a really interesting case study in that, in that regard. Um, so in the talk now today, I will examine how this memory of the suffrage movement and how this narrative of the story uh, was shaped uh, and came to be, but also how it's being revised um, in recent years and what this revision um, can tell us both about um, the past, but also maybe about um, uh, the, the present and the future. Um, and the history of, um, of the suffrage movement um, and the memory of it as well uh, was for many, many years was actually shaped by the movement itself. Um, both uh, early leaders uh, like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who might be uh, the most famous suffragist um, in our, you know, on public school, probably your children will know those names um, among all the leaders, and there were a lot of leaders. Um, they were very much aware of what they're doing and the historic role that they were playing. And they really put a lot of effort in uh, controlling and in telling that narrative um, according to their perspective. Um, so the maybe the best, or at least the most, uh, one of the most important documents that historians have uh, today is this grand project that uh, titled The History of Women Suffrage. Um, it was written by Susan B. Anthony and Katie, um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, as well as other prominent suffragists like Frances Gage and Ada Harper. And uh, this is a very kind of like it's a life project. And it's really amazing um, that at the time, um, they already understood that what they're doing is historic and they need to preserve it. Um, so for historians, it's actually a great thing uh, because not all social and political movements um, at the time kind of like realized, oh, maybe we, what we should do is important. So we should save kind of like the stuff that we're doing. Um, and, and suffragists understood that they need to keep it and they need to keep the documents and they need to tell the story um, from their own perspective and not let the media tell that story. Um, and the history of women suffrage is that a project, like we are telling our story. It's a four volume project, um, thousands and thousands of pages um, so it's a really, really long volume. It's all available online on Project Gutenberg because uh, there's no copyrights anymore. Um, so you can read it. There, it's a very useful um, historical source, uh, very well researched. But as all historical sources, um, it does tell the story uh, from the perspective of Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth K. Stanton. And this is a bit of... Um, narrow perspective, right? Um, especially with its claim and aspiration, right? They're trying to tell the history of the woman's suffrage, uh, but really what they're telling is their own story. So the emphasis is mostly on their organization, which was the National Women's Suffrage Association, and later on uh, what became the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Um, and suffrage was never one single organization. And yet, if you read the history of women's suffrage, you would get uh, the, um, the picture that maybe there was only one woman, but there wasn't. Um, and, and so it's kind of like a limited view, um, especially be because it's aspired to tell the story of all women's suffrage, but really they're telling um, their own story and they're, and you know the result of it is that the marginalization of other movements, especially those who kind of like oppose them, um, and other uh, voices and other activists who doesn't get the full attention uh, that they might uh, need to get. Um, the other kind of like big organization that was around was the National Women uh, Party, and. Uh, they also produced their own histories. They had a lot 
uh, a lot less kind of like big statement. They're only telling the story of the Women's Party, right? Um, not the entire women's suffrage, uh, but either through their uh, newspaper or the, the book. Um, and they too, at the end of the day, um, telling their own story, which is limited, although, uh, and for many, many years, uh, despite the fact that they were uh, very important parts of the struggle, uh, they weren't really part of the grand narrative. Um, I'm, I'm really glad that in recent years, the name Alice Paul become more and more familiar to people. Um, she led um, the National Women's Party uh, but for a long, a long time, the story that uh, suffragists were jailed, were um, hunger strike, were forced fed, were violently uh, treated, uh, that uh, suffragists picketed the White House and actually demand the vote. Yes, the vote was not given to women. Women actually, uh, you know, took it. Um, and uh, so that story was always. Um, was kind of like ignored and really only in recent years um, in about a decade, um, much thanks to uh, an HBO movie actually, Iron Jawed Angels, um, that that story kind of like coming back into the grand narrative of the suffrage movement. And yet they're still kind of like on the margins um so so we need to kind of like remember that um despite the wealth of documents that we have from the suffrage movement uh, both in the publications in photographs um in pamphlets and postcards buttons a lot of visual and material culture um that the suffragist uh, left us we need to more critically understand and think about those sources and who's really um and who really collected them and used them. Because when you tell your own story, and that's what suffragists did, um, they took control of it, but they also kind of like curated it. Um, so as critical historians, we need to kind of like also think, um, what are they omitting? Uh, what are kind of like the dark history that they're hiding, right? That they don't want us to know. Um, and think about kind of like the, the, the story that they left it is the story they wanted to tell, um, not necessarily uh, of what happened. Um, and history, as you all know, is written by the victors, right? And that's part of the problem uh, that what we have left is the story of victory. Um, and we need kind of like, and that's what I think historians and other people are doing in recent years, it's kind of like digging, digging up of like, okay, what did they didn't want to tell us? What are those forgotten um, places of history and the suffrage movement that we still need uh, to figure it out? Um, so one of the big things that uh, you won't read about in uh, the history of women's suffrage or the story of women's party is really uh, the role of African-American um, women in gaining the vote. Um, in the large volume, four volume project of, of the history of women suffrage, uh, the only African American mentioned is Sojourner Truth, um, who was very famous at the time. But if you think about uh, thousands and thousands of pages, and she gets only a few pages, and she's the only woman of color in that volume. Um, and that just show kind of like the racial bias uh, that these women had um, against activists of colors and how much their story uh, was kind of like suppressed and silenced. Um, other voices of uh, Asian and Native American, Latina activists, all of them had a lot of influence in the places they were active in uh, are completely absent uh, from the official story of women's suffrage. Um, so people like Mabel King Lee, um, Zid Kalasa, Frances uh, Ellen Watkin Harper, and Adelina Otro Warren, all of these are women that are really being resurrected and their stories are being resurrected only in recent years. Um, and we're trying to figure out 
what exactly did they do? What, where did they do? And we know they had a lot of influence, but again, in those uh, public records, um, they're being forgotten. Um, so um, again, when we come to think about the 19th Amendment and uh, what does it stand for, uh, we need to remember and we need to ask ourselves, okay, what are exactly the centennial celebrates? Um, women got the vote, women's suffrage, um, women's rights. Um, there's a lot of things and we need to ask ourselves, uh, what is this uh, date standing for? And because um, uh, when we look at the 19th Amendment um, that you can see here that was uh, ratified on August 26, um, the story of the struggle um, is kind of like, at, at the first sight, seems like very simple, uh, very successful. Um, after seven, over seven decades of a, of a struggle on May 21st, 1919, the House of Representatives uh, passed the amendment and two weeks later on June 4th, um, the Senate followed, and then a really relatively short ratification process, uh, something that I think we cannot even imagine in 2020. Um, Tennessee became on August 18, uh, the 36th state to ratify the amendment, and by 26, it was certified into the Constitution. So right, kind of like a simple story. What, what, what has to do with it? Uh, but if you look more closely at the, the wording of the 19th Amendment and thinking about the fight, um, you can see that the 19th Amendment actually did not give the right to vote um, to women. It actually did not give any rights. Um, it only uh, determines that the right to vote cannot be uh, denied on account of sex, but it's not actually, it's not an active amendment. Um, it's not actually giving right to vote um, and uh, certainly not giving, you know, other rights um, or equality or thinking about in those terms. And really, even if we looking only about voting, um, the 19th amendment did not give all women the right to vote. Um, it didn't give them anything, but even that, um, not all women uh, were able to vote um, uh, after the after 1920. Um, in a matter of fact, I mean, even before it passed, uh, 15 state already had women's suffrage. So even before the amendment was passed, women were able to vote. Uh, but 1920 is an important milestone, not because um, after that all women could get the right to vote. Uh, but because it was an, an important milestone in a very, very long struggle of uh, voting, uh, voting rights and, and access to the, to the franchise uh, that really continues until today. So while in 1920, uh, the majority of white women um, and uh, some African-American women in the North were able to vote, uh, Native American women, for example, had to wait until 1924 when uh, U.S. Congress um, declared them, uh, both men and women, uh, declared them as citizens of the United States. Um, but even after that, um, it's only in 1948 that all barriers for Native American voting were struck down. Um, Asian Americans had to wait um, even, oh, sorry, even longer uh, to 1952 um, uh, to get the right to vote again, uh, to, uh, to be recognized as citizens. And it's not really until the 1965 Voting Rights Act that actually does give the right to vote, um, that voting became, um, open to all and access to the vote uh, became much more expanded uh, than it was in 1920, um, mostly for African-Americans in the South, but also to other minorities. Um, so maybe 1965 um, in terms of women voting is even a more important uh, centennial to celebrate um, than 1920. And maybe by then we won't have pandemics. So 
hopefully a uh, celebration would be a little more uh, festive. Um, but as you can see from this timeline, um, the story of women suffrage is not as simple um, as it looks. And, um, and we need to situate it in, um, especially in the memory of it, right? What did it achieve? What did it gain? In kind of like a broader perspective of a longer and more complicated effort um, to gain not only a uh, women's rights, uh, sorry, a woman's vote, but also women's uh, right. Um, and again, when we thought, when we think about women's suffrage, um, this was never kind of like the end, the end goal or the end to end everything, right? Um, women's suffrage was also always part of a larger agenda that talked about women's rights, um, even. Uh, the origins of the suffrage movement are coming from a different uh, uh, social movement that you might have heard of. Um, in the past recent years, uh, the uh, women's suffrage movement stems from the abolitionist movement. Um, but, and it was in 1848 in Seneca Falls uh, in New York that was really the first time, um, according to the story, uh, that women's rights um, were discussed as a separate issue. So kind of like the attempt to put it on the agenda as a separate issue and not kind of like as a part of a different um, organization. Uh, but even then, uh, the document that came out of this uh, convention, uh, the Declaration of Sentiments, which is um, based on the Declaration of Independence, but instead of saying all men created equal, it said uh, all men and women created equal. Um, and it does talk about, and one of the big demands is women's suffrage, but uh, it wasn't the only demand that the declaration made. Um, women's rights to own property, uh, women's rights within marriage, the right to employment, the right to education uh, were also issues um, that were um, discussed. Um, and uh, Seneca Falls is often seen as kind of like the first, uh, right, the beginning of the suffrage movement. Uh, but in recent years, historians are also kind of like uh, began to um, question this um, and to uh, argue for a, a different type of perspective. Um, and uh, Lisa, uh, Turnold, which is, a, she's a great historian uh, from Pittsburgh, um, and she's kind of like, um, her research is a really instrumental to that, um, of showing that if you, even if you ask contemporary um, at the time about the women's suffrage movement, um, they probably won't say 1848 as the beginning. Um, and uh, for example, the anecdote um, that I like to tell um, is that I can show you the Declaration of Sentiments. Um, this document does not exist. Uh, we don't know where it is. Uh, it's not in the National Archives. It's not in the Library of Congress. Nobody thought of keeping that document. <laughs> uh, it wasn't important enough to keeping it, right? And when you think about how much uh, these women were historically uh, consciousness about maintaining history and documenting history, won't you like, isn't it weird that they didn't keep the, the founding document of the suffrage movement? We have the table um, that you see here where Elizabeth Caden Sten uh, Katie Stanton wrote it. Um, we know what's in it and we know who signed it, but the actual document uh, is gone. Nobody thought of saving it. And partly because um, maybe at the time the Seneca Fall Convention was not seen as uh, the most important or the starting point of uh, the suffrage movement. And it, that kind of like what um, in Lisa Turnall calls the myth of Seneca Fall was a story that was later on uh, built into the movement um, in order to situate Antony and Stenton as leaders um, and seeing that movement um, in a different light. Susan B. Anthony, for example, uh, never went to Seneca Falls. Um, she wasn't there. 
Um, and later on, she was kind of like written back into that narrative, like she was there, uh, but she is not, um, she did not sign that declaration because she wasn't at the moment. Um, the, the really, um, at the time, kind of like the starting point uh, would probably be a two years, two years later in 1850, um, in what is considered the first National Women's Rights Convention that was um, held in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, that convention uh, was uh, much bigger, uh, um, 900 attendees coming from all over the country, even from California, who became a state um, only uh, two years prior or a year prior, sorry. And um, that convention also um, had a um, document, um, many important um, abolitionists and women's rights advocate um, were there, Lucy Stone, uh, William Floyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass, Lucretia Mott, Sojourner Truth. So it was a much more diverse um, uh, conference. It held, um, uh, it wasn't, you know, Seneca Falls and uh, it's close to here. It's um, in upstate New York, but it's still a very small place. Um, especially in the mid 19th century. Uh, Worcester is still much closer to Boston, much more um, well attended. Um, but even in that convention that was the first national women's rights convention, um, the issue of suffrage was not necessarily the one that was on the top of everyone's uh, mind. Um, one of the, uh, the kind of like the statement uh, defining the mission of the movement uh, was to secure for women political, legal, and social equality with men until women's proper sphere is determined by what alone should determine it, women's power and, and capacity, strengthen and refine, but in education in accordance to their nature. So even here, uh, the word suffrage is not um, really uh, clearly articulated, even though it was certainly in their mind, and even the movement, the name of the movement, uh, American Equal Right Association, that's what uh, they call themselves, talked more about rights and about uh, universal suffrage, um, not necessarily seeing uh, getting the vote as the most important thing. Um, however, by the late 19th century, uh, for all kinds of reasons that either you heard already, or I can talk about them more, in the Q&A, um, the suffrage movement led by Anthony and Stanton are much become much more focused on gaining a federal amendment um, and really narrowing their agenda to get the vote. Um, and then they also got their name suffragist, right? Because that was their main team. Uh, but we need to remember that women's suffrage was something that a lot of uh, movements picked up uh, because it suited their agenda, but it not was always the most important thing. Um, the actual, actually, um, the biggest women's movement at the time was not the suffrage movement, uh, but the Women's Christian Temperance Union uh, that fought for prohibition um, and against, uh, against alcohol. Uh, Frances Willard, uh, who became the leader, uh, endorse women's suffrage, uh, but the main uh, kind of like agenda of that uh, movement, which was the biggest in the United States, uh, was uh, to get the amendment for prohibition. And they were also more successful than the suffragists because the prohibition amendment is the 18th amendment. Um, and it passed before women had the right to vote officially, uh, right? So it shows that women can have political influence, um, even if they are not um, eligible uh, to vote, um, and they can still pass an amendment. Um, so, um, so thinking about that, and uh, kind of like uh, seeing that and putting that in context, context um, really, uh, I think, say something about the suffrage movement and how should we view it. 
Um, and a lot of really important suffragists as well came to the movement, not because um, they saw the suffrage as the end goal, but actually more as a means to achieve other rights. Um, Bill Sherwin, for example, who is a very uh, prominent uh, Cleveland uh, born suffragist, um, she became the national uh, president of the League of Women's Voter. Um, she started her suffrage career with the Consumer Leagues of Ohio. And that organization um, concentrated on campaigns to improve labor conditions, uh, a focus on retail and kind of like safe. Uh, safe manufacturing uh, conditions. And, we, and, and Sherwin in her work really understood that if she wants leverage uh, among politicians to pass all those uh, uh, protective legislation against uh, work uh, and labor, uh, she needs the vote. Women needs the vote in order to, for them to be able to influence. So for her, it was a, a means to gain um, other rights. Um, other suffragists who came from the labor movement, again, uh, uh, saw it as the way to strengthen their own agenda. Rose Schneiderman, uh, another famous uh, union organizer um, who saw her friends uh, uh, burned to death in the 1911 uh, Shirtwaist uh, factory fire in New York, <clears throat> really joined the suffrage movement in understanding that um, a vote is a fire escape, um, that a vote can help to protect women from, um, for, to save their lives basically in the factory. And only through that um, change can come. So for her, the vote was never kind of like, that's what she wants to gain. She wants to gain it um, in order to improve um, and to get workers' rights. And many, many in the suffrage movement had those type of agendas. Um, for Black women, uh, the fight was never for women's suffrage alone. They always fought for universal suffrage, both for men and for women, um, really in, in seeing the vote as a way to join society as equal members. Um, so it's a large, broader kind of like agenda of racial equality, not just gender equality. And as Raleigh, Lottie Rawlin argued in 1865, nine, sorry, uh, we ask for suffrage, not as a favor, not as a privilege, but as a right based on the ground that we are human beings and as such entitled to all human rights. So really even they see, saw the the right to vote as something that is part of um, a human rights agenda or a civil rights agenda, and and really in late in like recent years, uh, there's a growing attention uh, from historians from institutions to look at the role that uh, black suffragists and black activists played in gaining uh, the vote and really see that they were um, not just instrumental uh, to the struggle, but they really are um, were at the vanguard and the for forefront of that struggle, partly because what they really wanted was to expand the franchise, not only to women, but really to fight for universal suffrage uh, for everybody. Um, and, um, um, there are many activists um, that are now kind of like uh, having their day um, after they've been forgotten for many years. Um, Sojourner Truth, who was, um, as I said, the only woman who got in into the history of women's suffrage, uh, was always kind of like a, a known figure. Um, again, she, she was a former slave um, who became a suffragist. And she also kind of like really understood the power of controlling the story, controlling your image. Um, she was very savvy. Um, she copyrighted this image um, and made a lot of money out of it. <laughs> um, and uh, use it to kind of like use the money to promote herself, to promote her agenda. Uh, and even though she was a former slave, she never learned to read or write. Um, in this photograph, she presents herself as an intellectual woman. 
um, as a respectable woman with, um, with the needle. There's the book, there's all kind of visual cues in this picture that put her as a more respectable woman or as a more intellectual uh, than maybe uh, she really was. Um, Truth uh, kind of like received her fame in a very famous speech of Ain't I a Woman uh, that she gave in 1851 in Akron, Ohio, here. Um, and um, while she was very successful in controlling her image, she kind of like um, marketed herself as the oldest woman in the United States. Um, I'm not sure it was true, but um, that was her trademark. Um, and uh, uh, we know we don't really know when she was born. Um, that's another part of kind of like how she she claimed to be 110. Um, we're not really sure. It's probably not true. Um, but if she could control her image and how she present herself, um, her words were, were a different matter. Um, so her famous speech was actually doctored um, into uh, the history of women's suffrage by Frances Gage, um, who kind of like wanted to um, present truth as a, a kind of like to fit the stereotype of the nanny of the kind of like Aunt Jemima type of uh, slave. Um, Truth was never uh, in the South. She was not a Southern slave. She was a slave in New York. So she had, um, she spoke with a New York State uh, low Dutch accent. She wasn't, she didn't speak in a Southern accent. Um, and, but, but Gage took her speech and kind of like uh, lowered the dialect and made it sound like she was from the South in order to kind of like fit the stereotypes that she thought uh, would um, better suit, <coughs> I'm sorry, the, the movement needs, even though Truth herself tried to be much more um, intellectual and smarter than Gage uh, made her appear. And there's a really great comparison in the uh, Sojourner Truth Project uh, that really give you a chance to look at the speeches um, and see what, how hard they are different. So kind of like while um, Gage maintained the, the main argument of, and the sentiment of her speech about emphasizing women's equality alongside of men, um, she kind of like made through um, more, like less of what she was really uh, was. Um, and that's another kind of like example of how history is curated and what is the image that we're getting and why we should think more critically about the story uh, that we're being told. But Sojourner Truth is also a good example of really the constant tension that was uh, within uh, the movement between Black activists uh, that were often did not feel welcome, uh, that were often marginalized within the movement, um, and the white leaders who, um, in certain sense, uh, made an ideological compromise and decided that in order to get Southern votes, um, they need to, you know, to abandon their Black sisters and to uh, adopt more racist um, arguments and, um, and, um, and, uh, arguments and, and um, even actions, I feel, uh, to uh, achieve what they saw as the, that the, meet, the end justified um, all means. But again, it doesn't mean that um, African-Americans uh, did not fight uh, on their own. Um, they often did it through their own organizations, although uh, on the local level, um, uh, organizations like the National Women's Suffrage Association uh, were not segregated. Uh, some, there were some locals in Cleveland, for example, they were not segregated. But on the national level, um, it had a very problematic racial politics that many African American women preferred just to go to their own um, and do it on their own terms in their own organization. Um, the biggest one uh, was the National Association of Colored Women. It was founded in 1896 
and led by Mary Church Carroll. Um, and again, this organization um, fought for a lot more than just uh, suffrage. It fought for education, for anti-lynching against segregation and the Jim Crow laws. So it had a broader agenda and one of them was suffrage and it was universal suffrage, but for men in the South, uh, which by then um, are barred from, the, from voting um, and for women uh, voting. Um, in Ohio, uh, the organization was led by Jane and Edna Hunter, um, who also uh, founded the Phyllis Whitley Association that was kind of like a, a settlement house for black girls in Cleveland and then later on in other cities. Um, the National Association of Colored Women uh, did participate in the famous uh, Washington DC 1913 parade. Um, this was the first national parade that really put women's suffrage on the national news and on as a national issue. Um, and African-American women did participate in it. Um, but uh, succumbing to Saturn pressure, Alice Paul uh, did not bar them from marching, but asked them to march in the back um, in order not to angry uh, Southern uh, suffragist. Uh, so Terrell, for example, uh, marched with Howard uh, University chapter of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority, um, really preferring, and a lot of uh, Black suffragists did that, they preferred to kind of like uh, let go their own pride and their own uh, thought and kind of like for the greater good and for the greater cause of gaining suffrage. Um, Ida B. Wells was not that compliant. Um, she was well-known activist, um, both for anti-lynching and uh, her suffrage activity. Uh, she was the founder of the Alpha Suffrage Club in Chicago that uh, really uh, organized black women to support candidates who supported uh, women's interests. Um, and Wells demanded that she said, I'm not going to march in the back. I want to march with the Illinois delegation. Um, and uh, after being refused, uh, she just joined them from the crowd and integrated um, the parade on her own. Uh, this photo is the only photographic evidence that we have of that. Uh, it was published in an African American newspaper a few days um, after the parade. Um, and it really is part of kind of like the problem we have as historians. Uh, we know that women marched in parade. We know that women picketed the White House. We know that women, that black women did all those things, but we don't have photographic evidence almost of anything uh, because um, white suffragists were very well aware of like not to have the photographs that day. Um, right, and the, they didn't invite the press that day when Black women uh, picketed the White House or when they uh, released photographs of parades, they did not release the photographs where Black women were included. Um, so it's really up to historians and up to people who are wanting to tell those stories to go and look in different places because what suffrage has left us um, is not uh, necessarily uh, what went on. Um, and, um, and again, um, if they're not, you know, if Black uh, suffragists at the time did not um, recognize, uh, got the recognition that they deserve, um, they definitely get more recognition now and also more awareness that uh, the struggle uh, for and the passing, the ultimate passing of the 19th Amendment was not such a huge um, milestone for them. And that uh, the, the continuous fight to gaining women's suffrage and suffrage in general um, continued well beyond uh, 1920s, um, mostly in the civil rights movement. Um, and that women were in the vanguard of that black women uh, were at the forefront of um, voter registration efforts in organizing people to vote um, and in um, and in the 
passing uh, of eventually the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Um, so really putting back women, black women into the story of suffrage um, also extends its narrative, maybe not to 1920, uh, but maybe a, a bit longer. Um, but also um, for the white struggle, right? Um, as I said, uh, the 19th Amendment did not give the right to vote. Um, it did not grant any right. And many suffragists uh, understood that. Um, that, you know, that's, it was, it was a really big achievement, uh, but it certainly uh, did not kind of like end the fight. Um, Ellis Paul uh, continued her fight uh, with presenting um, uh, the Equal Rights Amendment and um, other, um, and the National Women uh, Suffrage Association uh, turned into the League of Women Voters. Um, and really an understanding that, okay, we have all these women who um, have the right to vote now, but we need to educate them. We need to encourage them to be, become part of that system in which they were barred from for so long. Um, and the League of Women Voters, um, who is kind of like the transformation of the National Women Suffrage Association, really focused its effort on uh, uh, getting women to vote, uh, of educating them on the political system and encourage their participation both in, as representative and as uh, voters. Um, and um, on the other hand, Alice Paul, of course, um, introduced uh, the Equal Rights Amendment, really understanding that suffrage is only the first step, right, in this uh, process. Uh, she uh, uh, presented it in 1923 uh, to Congress, and we're still uh, fighting to get it ratified. Uh, the state of Virginia became the 38th state to ratify it just uh, last year in 2019. Uh, and now it's the big debate whether it's going to be certified or not. But it was a really, really long battle that really uh, lasted um, until very, very recently, uh, but oftentimes is remembered mostly in the 70s um, and women's right to gain uh, uh, the Equal Right Amendment. And again, uh, these stories are now being told as part, or, or the suffrage movement, it's being told as part of that story. Um, that story that doesn't end in 1920, uh, but really continues um, well into the 20 and even the 21st um, century. Um, another group that is getting uh, much more attention in recent years um, is actually uh, the women who were against suffrage. Um, so, um, and really in understanding that we need to understand the motivations of women who did not want to get the vote. And there were a lot of women like that. Um, as I said, the suffrage movement was not the biggest movement in the United States. And many people were just indifferent, uh, both men and women. It's not uh, true that all women fought for the vote. And there were actually a lot of women who fought against women's suffrage. Um, and again, thinking about and revisiting that movement showed us that it wasn't about men who just wanted uh, to keep women at home. And it was not even about women who wanted to stay home. Um, it was more about women who thought that, you know what, we want political influence, we want a political voice. We just think that the vote is not the best way to get it. And they feared that gaining the vote would lose them the influence and impact that they already had um, and thought that was much more um, effective than the vote. And, and you know, they had the 18th Amendment, <laughs> right, to, to show uh, they were right. So I think those type of debates and, and um, arguments that are uh, getting more and more attention uh, present a more complex uh, history and picture of the suffrage movement and also about the diversity. Women are not uh, as kind of like people fear, they're not voting as one block. Uh, gender identity is not that the most um, 
permanent identity that women have. Women are also Republican and Democrats and, and have a lot of other identities. Um, and they're not just one uh, size fits all. And, and I think learning about that diversity um, also uh, give us another perspective of the depth of the suffrage movement. Um, so um, in recent year, uh, maybe um, the debate has shifted and mostly uh, as we get closer to the centennial about uh, what is the legacy of the suffrage, right? What, what did it change? What did it gain? Um, so yes, women are now much more part of the political system. The 106th Congress is the most diverse and has the largest representation of women in history. Um, but um, on the other, so women did change politics and it is important. Like, although I kind of like spent a lot of time telling you how much 1920 is not such a big milestone, it's not that important. Um, one thing that, that the 19th Amendment did change uh, was uh, the way we perceive politics. Um, politics were, were a very dirty thing in the 19th century. Uh, voting was not something you would take your kids to show them, you know, the, uh, <laughs> how democracy is being played out. Uh, voting polls were oftentimes in saloons, in brothels, in places that you wouldn't really want to go as a woman, as a child, you know, you want to take your children into. It was something very dirty. Um, and women changed that. The, the 19th Amendment changed that because now women were, uh, were able to vote and they needed a respectable place to do it. Um, also women topic uh, that were considered to be not the stuff of politics, things like healthcare, like welfare, like um, family values, like education, things that, you know, today, these are the stuff of politics. But back then, these were a political subject that women dealt with. Um, and once women got the vote, these were the topics that became part of politics. So definitely, um, that's something that has changed. Um, and although, as I said, women um, never voted as a block, um, even though it was a big fear that that's what happened when women vote, um, they did manage to promote um, issues that were um, important to them. Um, and it's only in 1976 uh, that we can really talk about women as an influential group when the gender gap um, in elections began to matter. So very, very uh, later um, in the process, not in 1920, um, but really, really um, 1976, 1980, we see uh, the role of women in shifting and determining politics. And this year um, in 2020, it does seem that it's women who are going to um, determine the election. Um, so we did have some progress um, in that last 100 years. Um, uh, so I can't say that the 19th century and uh, the 19th amendment did not change anything, uh, but it is. it took a while um, to really, um, understand um, its, um, its, its, um, its, its repercussion. And now we have a, a female VP, we had a female presidential candidate. And I think, um, you know, those things take longer and then, then we, we want them to do, to, to do and we want to think of them this way, uh, but we do see uh, those changing um, coming up. And I, I want to close and, and kind of like discuss the last uh, maybe issue about how we think about commemoration um, in, th in talking a little regarding um, movements, uh, sorry, monuments and statues. Um, that is also a topic that kind of like came into the news uh, recently in the relation in, in regards with the Confederate status. And uh, really for a movement that, as I said, its leaders were really conscious about the historical role they were playing, um, the public sphere is actually uh, conspicuously uh, empty from suffrage monuments or from ways to commemorate um, this big movement. 
Um, and for women, um, um, it's really it's really strange. I mean, I have no good answer to why to why it is. I mean, the only uh, monument in Capitol Hill uh, uh, that celebrated the suffrage movement was almost uh, was hidden for almost seventy six years. Um, that uh, statue that it's uh, titled the Women's Movement or the Park Portrait Movement uh, Monument. Um, or even the bathtub, uh, that's the kind of like the name that it was getting because it's like women in a bathtub. Um, that was dedicated into the Capitol Rotunda in 1921 by the NWP on Susan B. Anthony's birthday on February 15th. Um, the monument shows the portraits of Susan B. Anthony, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Lucretia Moth. Um, again, showing a very um, certain narrative of the suffrage movement. Um, and a, a couple of days after this very big ceremony, induction ceremony, it was moved to the basement uh, where it stayed under until 1997 uh, when it returned to, um, to disrupt the old man um, statues in the rotunda. Um, when it, when the discussions of, of bring it back began, um, there were a lot of criticism about the narrowness of the representation. There were calls to add um, Sojourner Truth into the statue um, and uh, legislation to do it uh, began um, in 2004, but unfortunately it failed. Uh, but in 2009, a separate statue of truth uh, was unveiled in the Emancipation Hall in the U.S. Capitol. So um, you win some, you lose some. Uh, but that, those are the only uh, official statues that we have, uh, both in the mall or in Washington, in the Capitol Hill, about women's suffrage. Um, and the this discussion of what exactly, how exactly to commemorate, who exactly to commemorate, and how um, really coming into the fore um, in the centennial years. Um, and of course, COVID has um, kind of like uh, hindered and slowed a lot of those discussion, uh, but there is a, a new uh, suffragist memorial uh, that's supposed to be uh, inaugurated sometimes this year, um, that uh, about the National Women uh, Party picketers and jailing. Um, it will be in Occoquan, Virginia, where their jail uh, used to stand. Um, so there is more, um, more to expect. I hope uh, that people will get to know. And that's, an, again, another effort to put them into this grand narrative of the story. Um, there are statues um, in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, that commemorate suffrage, of course, in Seneca, uh, Seneca Falls. Uh, and there is also a project to put um, historic markers um, along uh, the suffrage uh, events and routes um, and to create the suffrage trail um, across the country. Uh, but that we don't have really kind of like a public presence um, in terms of statues and public uh, memorials um, in public sphere. And, and again, I think part of it is, is this constant battle of um, what do we remember and who we remember and who we are and who do we want to forget. And so kind of like, History is a life thing and, and memory is not found, is made. Um, and I think this year and maybe next year um, is a good time to think uh, how do we make this memory um, or how do we change it? Um, so as the history of, of gaining the right to vote and extending voting rights are getting more and more attention, both because of the election um, and the centennial year, I think that the conversation of how do we remember and what do we remember uh, will probably not gonna slow down as well and will continue. Um, so we'll 
hopefully to see you in the next centennial and I'll tell you what has changed. Um, so <laughs> I'll stop here and uh, we'll do questions. Hello again. Um, I'm, I'm so glad you brought the Turning Point Memorial up. Um, we did have earlier in this week, we had a discussion with Dr. Katherine Jellison, who's part of the group that's trying to pull this back together. And we did post a link um, for more information on this memorial. I did not realize when she was talking about the memorial, how few statues there actually are um, around the country, which is fascinating to me, but um, this there's more information and we could probably post it again. But if you wanna learn more about this memorial, we did post the link. Um, she said that it's kind of on hold a little bit right now because of donors yeah. and COVID and everything's kind of on hold right now, unfortunately. Um, but so I'm really glad you brought this up and I am a huge fan of the idea of a suffrage trail. So I don't know who, <laughs> is thinking about that, but I would love to get on board with that somehow. There is actually, I mean, just Google suffrage trail and I know there is activity in Ohio as well, um, as well as in other states and really mm -hmm. to gain volunteers to put on markers, historical markers. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's a really ongoing uh, project that is also very interesting. Well, that would be, that'd be something to tie. Um, Lakeside has a long history of having suffragists speak at Hoover Auditorium. Um, we've also had some anti-suffragists who spoke. Uh, so it's, it has a long history also with the suffrage movement. Well, um, I'll give it a few more minutes to see if anyone has any questions, but I want to thank you again uh, for joining us. This has been a really great way to work out our week and a lot of information we hadn't thought about in terms of um, the decades surrounding the suffrage movement, but also continuing into present day. Um, and I wish you the best of luck with your <laughs> semester you. this fall. I know that it'll be interesting for you. Yes. Um, but we would love to have you here to check out um, Lakeside here next year. Um, sure, I'll but, be happy to do that this time in person. <laughs> this time in person. We all hope to be back to some things in person a little bit more normalcy in a normal season way, but we'll, we'll see as the year goes on. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you all who watched. If you do have any questions, I'm sure Dr. Rubinovich Fox would be happy to answer any of those that I sent her way. Um, and we will keep in contact with everyone who uh, gave a program this week. But um, with that, I will send it out and we're all sending our love from Lakeside and hope you have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here.